Hi! <laughs> Welcome to Chelsea. I know. You guys, we're live from Chelsea, Michigan, home of home of the Bulldogs and Jiffy Mix. Jiffy Mix. Corn Mix. Yes. State, yes. wait, isn't it? Aren't you guys state football champions? Yeah. Of whatever just football. Conference of not yeah. Super Bowl champion. No. Other uh, football champion. Yeah. High school. High school. Of our size and weight. I, yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I didn't go to any of the games. That's all right. Shame. I know. I know, right? I work on Fridays. Friday night's my late night. <sighs> Plus, I wouldn't have gone anyway. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it's outside and it's cold. Um, did you watch any of the Super? Speaking of that, we did. We were not on. We did not broadcast last with you guys because of the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Did you watch the Super Bowl and Brothers? Um, no, because of sporting. Okay. And I don't really do sporting. Also, honestly, Duncan and I don't have cable. In fact, we don't even have a TV. We, we stream everything. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh, that sounds like a lot of work for something I don't want to watch. So what did I watch instead? Oh, you know what I, I did? Um, HBO Max right now has um, uh, A Nightmare Alley, uh, the Guillermo del Toro movie. So I watched that for the third time. <laughs> There you go. It's amazing. That's okay, and I watched the Super Bowl for both of us. At least I watched part of the Super Bowl for mm -hmm. both of us. I watched the first half. And I watched the all important halftime show. Oh, very good. Um, which I liked. I thought I was oh, I'm eating cookie. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I actually really enjoyed the Super Bowl halftime show. As a, I always thought hip hop was fun. I still do. Um, um, a lot of people didn't like it or whatever but i think if you're if you're of a certain age you're not going to enjoy that at all so, <laughs> sorry old people old white people <laughs> this is not your show this is not this show is not for you <laughs> but again though if you're going to have a super bowl in la why don't you celebrate la music la music you know so you have you know snoop dogg la dre la kendrick Lamar, la and then you got Mary J's from New York and Eminem's from Detroit. So I loved it. Anyway, um, let's see. So here we are today. And the reason that I'm eating cookies during the show is because we are celebrating. Uh, we watched a really great documentary a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And then we ate while we watched it. Mm -hmm. And then we ate before we watched it. Mm -hmm. and then we ate after we watched it. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly hungry the whole time. I know it was weird. I just never got full that day. Uh -uh. Mm. So yeah. Mm. So anyway, the documentary we're, we're talking about is uh, the documentary. I'm gonna go ahead and put it in the stream here. Ooh, I gotta get rid of our brand. Hang on, I gotta, I gotta take the brand off. There it is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're talking about the documentary uh, Julia, which was released last year in 2021 that chronicles the awesomeness of Julia Child. So. And it was. And of course, if you know anything about Julia Child, she was all about food. So what better way to celebrate and appreciate Julia by eating some food? Wow. A lot of food. Because she loved food. It was her passion, and for so sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So Anne brought this up that we should watch this documentary a couple of months ago. And then we're like, well, not only should we watch the documentary, but then we should talk about it. And then we should eat about it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump into our presentation. So. I don't know. Is there anything else we needed to talk about? Any um, small talk we needed to deal with? I don't before? think so. I was like, we could talk more about who Julia Child was, but I'd like to think that if you would know. Exactly. So, and if you don't, you're going to learn. You're going to find out. You're going to find out soon. Um, I feel like I should comment on the weather. February, right? Am I right? You're right. Okay, good. Yeah. I did it. All right, good. Mm -hmm. All right. So again, the documentary is called Julia. Some stuff, oops, some stuff you should know about the documentary. There it is. Uh, you should know that this is a 2021 documentary. Uh, it was directed and produced uh, by Julie Cohen and Betsy West. Um, it discusses the life and impact of Julia Child on America's current food landscape. And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the presentation. But if you spend any time on cable television or have any sort of streaming service, then you'll notice that a big bulk of those streaming services and cable television is dedicated towards some sort of food something. Food eating, food going to eating places, food preparation, food preparation and eating, stuff to preparate food with. Yes. And just competitive food shows. Oh, and the competitiveness of food yes. shows. And Gordon Ramsay yelling at somebody in a kitchen on a food show. 
So unnecessary. Un totally unnecessary. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this this landscape of food that we live in now and all these shows that deal with some sort of person eating food, person trying food, person taking you, it really does go back to this this to this woman, Julia Child. So this documentary discusses the impact that she had on America's current food landscape. Um, it's a really excellent uh, history of what shaped her and kind of put her on the path of being America's first, you know, really TV chef rock star. Um, it shows this really amazing, her amazing story, the amazing love story that she had with food and her husband, Paul. Um, it's an inspiring look at the woman who changed the way we eat in America. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, if you're looking to look to, to watch this, and I really think you should, because mm -hmm. you told you. I think everybody should watch this because it's really great. Um, it's currently available to rent on Prime. Uh, it's five ninety nine for a forty eight hour rental, mm -hmm. and it's worth it. It is because last night when um, it was uh, it was time for me to like start writing up my portion of the slides, I was like, I had my notes, but I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just gonna rewatch it. So I rented <laughs> it, rewatched it. So glad I did. Still, absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's only like ninety minutes. So yeah, it's <clears throat> it is um. So we're gonna talk a little bit first about why this documentary is awesome, and would you like to take that? Well, um, I have a number of reasons, and most of them start with Julia is. Julie, one of, one of the things they talk that's great about this is you get to see her tenacity. And, um, you know, she took, she and her co-writer took 12 years to write this book, uh, which is the uh, art of, or the mastering of, um, mastering the art of French cooking. That's the copy of the book you see in the slide right, right now. now. Yeah. So, um, you know, just the, you know, and there was no... Facebook, there was no texting, there wasn't even a fax machine. So, and these, these two women, they did not live in the same place. So the back and forth between recipes, the um, trial and error of all these recipes, I mean, it took them, it took them over a decade to write this amazing book. And if you aren't truly passionate and tenacious, she would get her teeth into something and that's what she would do. And she would do it until it got done. Another thing you get to um, experience in this documentary is uh, Julia's curiosity. Everything seemed like an adventure to her, you know, and, and she made it fun. I mean, she's one of those people you just want to be friends. You would want to be friends with because oh. no matter what you did with her, it was going to be a blast. Um, uh, another thing was uh, Julia, you get to experience her boldness. Uh, this was a woman who had, uh, she pursued her, her, she pursued everything with passion and it, you know, her age had nothing to do with it. You know, she didn't, she didn't start becoming a, a this amazing chef, this star chef until she was in her fifties. So, you know, she just got this, this boldness, um, her imagination. If she didn't, if there wasn't, if she wanted to do something and there was nothing, uh, she created it. Like she created this cookbook. There was no recipe books for French cooking in English. And here, and so like, well, that's what I, that's what she wanted. She like, she was spending all this time and energy trying to find this English recipe, this English cookbook, you know, French recipes, nothing. So what'd she do? She created it. Uh, her intelligence. Uh, she understood, seemed to naturally understand that you, the best way to learn is by making mistakes, was not afraid to make mistakes at all and, and, and not afraid to make them publicly, which is amazing in this day and age where we all think we have to be perfect. Uh, she was amazingly adaptable and uh, both in her personal and her private personal and public life. So I, I don't want to get too much because I don't want to spoil things, but she just, you know, rolled with the punches or steamrolled things to make them work. It was amazing. <laughs> um, you know, the thing is, in this day and age, everybody that uh, has to do with food seems to be marketing something something to you, their, their cookware line, their knife line, um, their, their food line, whatever. She The only thing she ever marketed was cooking and food. That's all she marketed it. She didn't have a line of products, which in this day and age is amazing. It's unheard of. Um, another thing that I loved about this documentary is the French, oh, hi, Katie, is the French rule, which means when you are served, you eat. Yeah, there's no waiting around for everybody else to get their food. Uh -uh. You just eat. You just eat. <laughs> I loved that. I loved permission to do that. Yeah. So these were all some of the reasons why I think the documentary is awesome. And I have some more. Yes, because this next slide was going to be why this documentary is not awesome. However, there's nothing about this documentary that's not awesome. So here's more things that are awesome about this documentary. Jenny? Um, well, I said, uh, I think it's really great that there's many chefs throughout the documentary that comment that um, uh, on, on Julia Child, like we see Jacques Pepin, we see Ina Garten, we see, I can't think of his name, Sam Samuelson, um, I can't think of his name. Um, there's 
Oh, the Spanish chef. I can't think of his name either. Sorry, you guys. I But I don't want to spoil everything. But just really, it, it just talks about her importance and what she brought to this country. Um, she taught us that we deserve better than food that came out of a can or food that came out of a freezer. The, the early part of the documentary kind of shows you what the cooking landscape was like in America after World War II. And it was banquet frozen dinners and it was <laughs> soup is a sauce. <laughs> Yeah. So what I what I love about what she did is she basically said, there is something better out there. Here's how you're going to do it. So she she allowed people she taught people to not only um, that there is a better food landscape out there, but that food landscape is not unattainable to you, that you can use the products that you have in American grocery stores um, to in order to to make really wonderful and delicious food. And that's one of the things I appreciated when I read her autobiography. Um, I, I appreciated the fact of what she was trying to do. And this is one of the things I did not realize is that European butter, European sugar, European flour, because they're processed differently, they act differently in recipes than American sugar, American butter, American flour. And that was a problem for anybody trying to follow French recipes in an American kitchen. And so that was one of the things that she did was to help develop these recipes using American products, which was that which makes me one of, you know, makes Julia Child literally one of my favorite scientists because everything she did was trial and error and experimentation and repeating the process and trying it again. And so that's one of the things I, you know, when I'm t teaching science in my classroom, I, I talk about Julia Child is, is one of the, you know, really one of the greatest scientists because she really had to go through that scientific process again and again. So, um, the French food critic. That was one you wrote. Yeah, um, they are, they have an interview with a French food critic who uh, remains anonymous, and just some of his commentary about food, about French food, about Julia Child. It's just delightful to hear him mm -hmm. um, talk about this. So uh, I thought he was one of the. I mean, in a, an awesome documentary. He was a very memorable part. Uh, they have beautiful food preparation cinematography in this movie. I mean make you want to weep it's so beautiful and of the all of them my favorite one was the poached pear tart that you watch them make <sighs> yeah it's and that's one of the things I, I talk about sexy is that the cinematography in this movie, movie is it is as beautiful as any sweeping landscape of this a movie yeah. that you've ever seen in any movie it, they really spared no expense in terms of filming this food and you just, you, it's stunning. You literally stops you. It takes your breath away when you're looking at this gorgeous art in front of you. I'm like, Duh, beautiful. It is, it is beautiful. <laughs> and of course, um, one of the, uh, I think one of the best parts of the documentary is um, the love story between uh, Paul Child and Julia Child. It was just, um, it, this is a quote from Julia, um, feed your man, fuck your man, flatter your man. The three F's of a good marriage. <laughs> And their love story was, it was just, you know, he was 10 years older than, than she was when they, when they met, he was not that enthusiastic about her. And you can see in his letters, they, they talk a lot about their letters and I show you excerpts of their letters and, and you can see him slowly falling in love with this remarkable woman. So uh, that was, it was just very, very touching. And then of course you get to know Paul Child as a man and uh, you know, he was uh, talk about the royal consort. I mean, here he is with this woman who is the, not the queen of, of, of food. She is the empress. And he was so content to be there for her 100% in every way, shape or form. And I, I thought that was a, a beautiful um, aspect of their relationship. Uh, Julia Child was pro-choice and adamant pro-choice. She's one of the first celebrities who came forward in any sort of, um, uh, any sort of like social um, movement and um, supported it, uh, publicly supported. She also did that with um, with AIDS. So uh, she was one of the early early proponents of that. So that was um, I thought that was really remarkable too. And again, how adaptable she was, how she could see things changing in her lifetime, and how she needed to change and support what was coming. Uh, of course, the cinematography. The cinematography was just it's, ridiculous. It's just it was amazing. So, so good. So, so amazing. <laughs> uh, fun fact about Julia Child, at 6'2", she was the shortest of her siblings. So she had a sister and a brother, and she the brother was 6'4", and her sister was 6'3", and then you had no, little... her sister was 6'5". Her sister was 6'5", her brother was 6'4", and then you had little Julia at 6'2". <laughs> So yeah, that was a, a tall family. And yeah, this is at the end of this movie, uh, the, the documentary, you'll get the feels for real. You will. Yep. You you'll, will. you'll get all weepy. Yeah. Even if this, after I saw it the second time, I think I got a little bit more weepy the second time. Yeah. I totally cried. I cried. Yeah. 
like for real. Yeah. Yeah. Because the story, I mean, you know, when, you know, they talk about Paul's death, Paul died before Julia and just, you know, you know, like I said, you just get the feels. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. yeah. You do. Yeah. And they, he was a, a, Paul was a photographer. So they have these awesome pictures of them, like in Valentine photos that were hilarious. This one <laughs> with a bathtub and a bubble bath together. So wonderful. Adorbs. Ador- adorbs. It's adorbs. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah. So they're, I mean, from start to finish, I mean, her story is remarkable. It's amazing um, how her life could have been really different because she was, um, you know, she was Southern California, Pasadena money. And the expectation is because she was Southern California, Pasadena money, that she would be a homemaker for some other Southern California, Pasadena money. Mm-hmm. And the fact that she didn't want that, you know, she went out, she went east, she went to Smith College. Uh, and the best thing that probably happened for her was World War II, because now she had, um, she joined, you know, she joined the force and she had a reason to leave, you know, and that's what she did. And had that not happened, she probably would have ended up back in this, as, as some banker's wife yeah. in Southern California, yeah. because that's what you did. And, you know, one of the things that she learned from uh, Paul Child was how little she knew. Mm-hmm. You know, here's this woman, she's incredibly well-educated, she's you know wealthy, but knew, but was not in any way, shape or form worldly. And so that's what that experience of being overseas and meeting Paul Child and started to learn the world um, and I think because she was intelligent, because she was tenacious, because she was strong, um, it really, those are the things that allowed her to eventually become who she was. Mm-hmm. And that experience was part of it. World War II was part of it. So, yeah. And I also think, you know, how like, um, Julia was not conventional in her look. Her look was not conventional. She was tall. Um, she was attractive, but she wasn't pretty. Uh, quote unquote. And then um, I think uh, because she wasn't conventional in her look, it gave her permission to not have to be conventional in, in other ways. You know, her her um, passion for uh, for the new, for seeing the new, for, for experience, that um, all of that would have been, um, should have been beat out of her a long time ago. You know, her, her, you know, but I mean, she, she was this, I think because she already wasn't conventional. Why even try? You, Correct. You know, I can either I can be conventional and be miserable, or I can be non-conventional and do what I like, and that's what she did. Yes, and I think it's it's interesting because you know her father was not. Her father was a mm-hmm. solid conservative Republican, and you know both both Julia and her eventually her husband's politics were very different from her father's. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I thought it was interesting in the documentary that her father was you know essentially opposed to her choices, but at the same time was the reason she was making those choices in terms of how he raised her and her strength and all of right. those things. I'm like, mm. yeah, it was one of those, like, um, I want you to have all these, um, you know, opportunities and advantages, but I want you to turn out the exact same way I did. <laughs> it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and your takeaways from this documentary. You know, one of the things that I, one of the big takeaways for me, and I used to be a teacher, and one of the things that I heard from people, sometimes behind my back, sometimes to my face, was that those who can't teach. And I always thought that was very insulting, because it is. And what Julia uh, demonstrates in this entire, what they demonstrate in this documentary about Julia, uh, was that she was constantly teaching people. And here she was one of the best at what she did. And she shared and she was able to um, be such a good teacher because she was the best that, of what she did. So those who can teach, keep that in mind, people. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so that was definitely one of my takeaways as well. And the other takeaway that I have is that um, there is no age at which you must stop pursuing your passions and there's no age at which that you cannot start pursuing your passions. You know, one of the cool things about Julia Child is she got started relatively late on her cooking career. She was already past World War II. They had moved to France and she was well into her um, late 30s, early 40s before she even started to pursue um, a cooking school. And then it was she was well into her 50s before she was even able to to start. You know, this you know, she was, I think, 52 when she started um, doing the television show. Um in Boston. So it's, it's like, we have this, we've, we've somehow decided as a society that unless you make it big by the time you're 27, that you somehow, 
aren't allowed to pursue those things that you're passionate about anymore or somehow not change your stripes or change your stars or whatever mm -hmm. you're doing. And, and what she showed is that's, that's not, that's not true at all. Mm -hmm. It's like, as long as, and, and even after, you know, so she did her show until 73 and then PBS kind of cut her loose because she was getting older and that she just continued, you know, she had different shows and different passions and different pursuits and she wrote other books mm -hmm. and she still was iconic um, in America because of what she was doing, even though she was 70 or 75 or 80. And that's one of the things that I love about her is that she wasn't going to let anybody dictate um, who she would become because of her age. Mm -hmm. Or really, you know, I think it's funny too, is like when, when she was older and the landscape of food started to change in the um, 80s when everything was like, you know, sugar-free or fat-free, oh, butter has so much fat. You know, now we all eat margin because butter has so much fat. You know, she never, she never changed being a French chef. She was always a French chef. And like, and her, you know, if you want to eat this food, then eat this food. And if you want to cook this way, then cook this way. Don't let anybody tell you that, oh, it's too fattening or, oh, there's too much sugar. And I'm like, then just, you know, just, if this is what you love, then do this. Then do that. And, that's, and that's very much how I feel as an eater. I don't like diet foods. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't enjoy them. I don't like sugar-free stuff. Um, if it means I have to eat a little bit less, then fine, I'll eat a little bit less, but I'm going to eat a little bit less of the things that are delicious to me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to, I don't like, I don't like to cheat myself. <laughs> no, and neither did Julie. In fact, it was, uh, uh, there was a number of people who commented that um, if she liked something on your plate, she ate it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love. Which I love. Oh, I'm just going to have some of this. I'll just have some of that. So yeah, I just, uh, I have such respect for, for that for those things. The fact that she was an amazing teacher. In fact, I actually wrote a paper on her for when I was getting my master's in distance learning because I felt like she was just really, you know, in terms of early distance learning, I felt like Julia Child was a really great teacher and showed you that you could teach. You don't have to be in the same room to mm -hmm. teach people that if you have people on the other end of, of that, that are interested and motivated, then they can be taught. Mm -hmm. And I and I still 100% truly believe that. And so anyway, wrote a paper on her because why yes, wouldn't I? Because why wouldn't you? Uh, all right. So how to watch this documentary? Because I know this may sound counterintuitive, but you, there's a definitely a way you should watch mm -hmm. this documentary. Because you'll be sad if you don't. You will be sad. And we don't want you to be sad. No. We want you to be happy. Exactly. Number one, watch while you're eating. Yes. So you don't, you don't want to be like, don't be doing other tech. Don't be paying your bills or typing a paper when you're watching this. Pay close attention to what's happening because you're going to want to. But do eat while you watch this. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> yeah, eat something. Yeah, you don't want because you don't want to miss anything. Because mm -mm. you know you, don't, you certainly don't want to miss the cinematography and they off, often flash um, like brief. Uh, um, sentences of the letters that Paul and Julia wrote, and you do not want to miss those because those are little gems. It, they are little <laughs> gems, and if you're sitting there doing something, you're going to miss them. That's so right. it's it's a layered movie. The good so, news is that you can eat while, while watching. Watch, best. watch, because yes. like right now, I'm going to demonstrate that with one of these delicious Girl Scout uh, Girl Scout cookies. Speaking of Girl Scout cookies, shrinkflation, man, shrinkflation. Look how tiny this box. I paid five dollars for that box of cookies. It's tiny. It's like half the size the boxes used to be. And the cookies are half the size as well. But no, no, no. I can still. <laughs> um, mm, mm, go, go, mm. Mm -hmm. wow. yes. So, um, we better, I think I have mouthful. Okay. Mouthful. No, uh, be prepared to be awed, mm -hmm. inspired, mm -hmm. impressed, mm -hmm. and hungry, mm -hmm. even though you have eaten through the entire movie. I know. Because, I mean, all I want right now is some of that, so, the soul in butter, in butter and lemon sauce. Oh my gosh. I know. Who knew that watching people make fish could be so sexy so <laughs> sexy i mean just sensuously beautiful mm -hmm. um i don't want to call it food porn because <clears throat> pornography um there's a certain sloppiness about pornography and this is not sloppy at all this is romantic romantic it's beautiful i guess it's like um yeah romantic yeah. and beautiful yeah it's work um mm. you should eat um also before you watch this movie mm -hmm. and immediately after you watch this movie mm -hmm. so basically just prepare yourself for about four hours of eating. Yes. Um, oh, and have some wine. You know, it makes me, this movie made me wish that I liked wine. You know, and I'm so glad I like wine. Deb Carr, I'm going to throw that out to you. If you're watching, thanks for teaching me how to like wine. There you so go. thanks Deb. Yeah. I appreciate you. Everybody, you know what I've been, what other show we've been watching? I've been watching Duncan and I, uh, we've been watching um, Ozark. Okay. They're always drinking white wine in that movie. So, <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> wanted, I'm like, I wish I liked wine more. I'm like, oh. look how cute they are drinking that wine. I tell mm -hmm. you, I know. <laughs> cute on Ozark drinking wine. Huh. <laughs> huh, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, how about that? Uh, so anyway, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the. So what we did, we made a, an afternoon of it. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, Anna Duncan came to Kalamazoo. We charcuterie beforehand and during, and then we went out afterwards. So I thought we'd take a few minutes and kind of talk about some of these places in Kalamazoo. A little shout out to the awesomeness. Kalamazoo, if you've not been to Kalamazoo recently, um, and many people don't because uh, I've described Kalamazoo many times as one of my favorite little dirty birds. And it is. <laughs> it's just this weird place. It's kind of dumpy and, you know. If you were ever in, if you lived in Ypsilanti during the late 80s and uh, 90s, mm -hmm. then you know, already know what Kalamazoo is kind of like. Um, and Kalamazoo kind of is kind of like um, uh, Ypsilanti was in 2008. So. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, it's, but at the same time, it's like Kalamazoo is really working hard mm -hmm. to to improve um and it has a really great restaurant scene. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But here's one of the places that we went to. It's this place called The Grazing Table. It's right on the corner of Burdick and I want to say South Street. And they it's a, essentially a charcuterie place where you can go there and you can get various boards, have a drink, have, get a board that has all kinds of yummy stuff on it. Um, this place is on our radar because when Joe and I bought our house in Kalamazoo, our realtor, Kim Too Good, by the way, if you're looking to buy or sell a house, Kim Too Good is the girl. So if you need more information, I'll DM you with information. But she got us a little housewarming gift of a box of uh, stuff from the grazing table. And it is outstanding. So good. And this, so the picture you see here is some of the stuff that you get. They have cheeses, they have meats, they have fruit, they have Olive. delicious crackers, olives, and it was yummy. This, this little, I got like a little box and then I put some other things together there and they're super helpful and nice and highly recommend it. So we ended up having this little plate of prosciutto and olives and salami and figs and grapes and blueberries and four kinds of cheeses, including a green chili cheese from Hatch, New Mexico. That was divine. Mm -hmm. So good. Oh, wait, we have to talk about what I brought. Oh, and what Ann brought was? Um, I went to the um, Agricole, which is here in Chelsea. It's a little farm market. And they um, bring in um, uh, produce and baked goods and crafts and all kinds of cool stuff from farms all over our region. And so I got uh, croissants from Crust, uh, which is a bakery up in Fenton. Very good. Uh, considered the best. It's actually, Crust is actually considered the best bakery in the state of Michigan. And it is really which good. Which is a bold claim. It is bold. But yeah, it's, it, honestly, it's my favorite. Super good. Super um, good. And then we, I found some blueberry uh, lavender jam, which just sounded so French. It's super yummy too. So I brought yeah. that. So that's what we had. Yeah. So we had croissant, we had charcuterie to start. And then afterwards, we went to... Um, a place called Principal Food and Drink, uh, which is right on the Kalamazoo Mall, which is right next door to uh, Gazelle, which is the running store right on the mall as well. And um, it, it's it's really an excellent little restaurant. So, Anne, what did you have at Principal Food and Drink? Uh, at Principal Food, I, I can't remember the cocktail I had. I just remember it was beautiful. And it was a little on the uh, more bitter side, so it wasn't super sweet. But it came in a lovely glass. It was kind of this burgundy color. Uh, it was beautiful, and I drank the whole thing. I can't remember what was in it. I think... <laughs> Some tequila because I really like tequila. It was a tequila. It was drink, a yes. tequila drink because I usually order those. Um, I always remember it was good. Don't remember the name of it, but I was really oh my gosh! I got to sit so that I was facing the bar, and they it, it was like it was like mixology heaven. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people were serious. The bar is for real there. For reals. <laughs> so um, and uh, then actually we had uh, we had this uh, cheese for our appetizer. Um, gosh, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's like this cheese that you grill and it's, it's kind the of cheese. It's the cheese that starts with an H. Yeah. Like a how, 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 how Duncan, Duncan? Duncan, what's the name of that cheese? I think you went back outside. Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, but I had the roasted chicken and uh, with twice baked potatoes, which I love. And then I had this sort of um, uh, Brussels sprout. Oh, Duncan, what was the name of that cheese that we had at Principal in Kalamazoo? The cheese that they grill. It's kind of bouncy oh, and yummy. Uh, it, it was basically, it was... Um, homely. Homely. Homely, homely. Yeah. homely, homely cheese. See, I didn't yes. remember it. So uh, very good. Now, the nice thing about a place like this is that they're not afraid to serve dark meat. So I had the half roasted chicken, but it came with dark and light meat. And I love dark meat chicken. Dark meat's where the flavor is. It's where the flavor was. So I was like, I like it when they're not afraid to do that, um, which me just means they know what they're doing. So that's what I had. I had the roasted chicken with the twice baked potatoes and then this... Um, Oh, a Brussels sprout uh, kind of um, vegetable thing that was, it was so good. It was delicious. I didn't eat it all. I took the rest home for lunch tomorrow. The next day, I was very happy. Good job, Ann Brothers. Thank you. Uh, I had the flank steak served medium. 
because I'm not a heathen. What what is that line from? Was that line from Thirty Rock? What am I, a farmer? <laughs> no, oh, an aristocrat. <laughs> so no, I had the flank steak medium, um, and they, it comes with a little crispy haystack onions, and it's on a bed of a horseradish cream, which mm. was delicious. Uh, and I had uh, little potato croquettes that went with that. Which mm. if you've never had potato croquettes, they literally should be served with everything. No more fries, just potato no croquettes. Problem. Duncan had the same thing. He thought it was very so good. good. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had a very expertly crafted, uh, old fashioned. Uh, with Maker's Mark, um, that may have been the best I've had in the city of Kalamazoo. And I've mm. been trying them all over Kalamazoo. Mm. In fact, I had two because the rule with old fashions is that one is not enough and three is too many. <laughs> so, there. so the sweet spot. <laughs> and we walked there. So that was good. See, too. totally. We totally walked there. And uh, then we had all the desserts. We, I'm not kidding. We, we ordered... Well, all there was desserts. like two we didn't get, but but we, they were like ice cream based. That yeah, I wasn't, you know, it's like, yeah. oh, try the try which which sorbet do you want? I was like, like none of them. sorbet, gross. Yeah, yeah, none of them. Uh, so yeah, we got we each got a chocolate pudding, which mm -hmm. was delicious, and then we each we split the little coffee cake, which is this delicious almondy eggnog, eggnog, eggnog coffee cake. And mm -hmm. then uh, Joe got the peanut butter banana split, and we had some of that mm -hmm. as well, which was so good. It was very good. Yeah. So overall, excellent, excellent meal. Um, I can see why it's, it's it, the principal is one of those places that consistently um, pops it up at the top of the restaurants mm -hmm. in Kalamazoo. And then there's one like literally next door, Rustica, which is a, another European style mm -hmm. restaurant. So that's that's next on the list. So. Um, we, we did really want to go to a French restaurant, but Kalamazoo doesn't really have a traditional French restaurant. Uh, so we did find did find us one in Detroit. So we're gonna go there sometime this spring. Well, maybe we should go um, when we uh, do that tour in uh, in April. Oh, good idea. Because I gotta save up for that. Yes, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, and you know, in the past, I've gotten really spoiled with French restaurants because uh, Denver had an outstanding French restaurant for years called the Central. Uh, unfortunately, it closed. Uh, I want to say five or six years ago. They just the people that owned it retired and they sold their building for just a dump truck full of money. So. Mm -hmm. Good for them, but what was great about La Central is that it was very affordable. You could, you could, you know, spend thirty dollars and get just an absolutely fantastic, you know, meal that included, you know, hors d'oeuvres, drinks, and dessert for thirty bucks. Yeah, the French restaurant in Detroit is like thirty bucks for for one, one thing for one part yeah. of it. <laughs> and then uh, when we were in um, living in Wisconsin, uh, we were not that far from the Twin Cities, and so there was a a really great French restaurant in St. Paul called uh, Meritage, which again very affordable. Just a really cool hip place. Delicious frites and mussels. Mm. So frites, y'all. Uh, so yeah. So again, if you're if you're looking for a nice place to take people, like people from out of town, you want to show show them a good time. Take <coughs> take them to Principal. Mm -hmm. It's really excellent. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did after watching. Um, so one of the things that kind of got me started. I've always loved to eat, but one of the things that really got me started um, in I would say finer dining was I started watching top chef in about 2006 and I got hooked. And one of the things I liked with that show is that not only was it a really interesting cooking competition, but I learned a lot about what fine dining meant. I really didn't know what that meant. And so I, what was cool was learning some of these techniques and some of these ideas that, um, that you see that, that takes dining from one level to the next. And so I really just got an appreciation for for what it takes to, to cook, what, what that means and what it means to, to cook and eat and technique and flavor and flavor profiles. And so I just kind of got sort of obsessed with that starting about 15 years ago. But and then I started watching more cooking shows. So if you're interested um, in learning more about cooking, these are some, I would say, worthwhile shows today that are not super. There's a lot of really bad Mm -hmm. cooking shows on television they're like the hell's kitchen where gordon ramsay yells at everybody or they have these terrible people that are doing terrible things i don't love the show chopped because i always feel like there's a lot of gimmicky stuff that goes into that mm -hmm. there's nothing gimmicky about these programs so um iron chef and iron chef america which is probably the granddaddy of all cooking shows it was originally a japanese show that started up in like 93 and then slowly but surely that kind of got picked up uh, in America, and you ended up with something called Iron Chef America, which is a cooking competition show. But again, pretty cool show. They're really, they basically, they basically give them just tons of ingredients to use, or they focus on a single ingredient, and then you get to watch chefs kind of figure out how they want to present that food in what way, shape, or form. And I really like that, because even though they're working against the clock, 
you see some really interesting techniques, some really interesting creativity. There's no yelling or screaming or calling each other names or it's just, this is what you have. This is how much time you have now make something amazing for five, uh, make a four course meal. That's amazing. Um, Top chef, like I said, is the, probably the first, I would say that is the cooking show cooking competition show that has paved the way for other cooking competition shows. Chopped was born directly from Top Chef because Ted Allen, who is the host of Chopped now, used to be a judge on Top Chef. So that was kind of born from that. Um, as far as if you would like to learn something about cooking, then watch the Barefoot Contessa. Mm -hmm. uh, that's Ina Garten. Um, she does a really, I think, one of the best jobs of all of the how to make stuff TV chefs because A, she does her entire recipes. She doesn't mm -hmm. leave things out. Paula Dean leaves things out, so you'll buy her recipe book. Nice. Um, but Ina Garten doesn't. She really she will take you from start to end all the way. She'll she'll take you shopping. She'll bring it into the kitchen. She'll show you how to prepare it. She'll show you how to serve it. <laughs> I want to be one of her friends so bad. I know, because she's always like, she lives in the Hamptons. Mm -hmm. And so she's always like going to these really nice places to shop for her ingredients. And then she makes these beautiful things. And then she invites like her neighbors over and they'll like have some sort of, you know, cookout on the beach or something like ridiculous. And I just, I just want to be your friend so I much. I know. I just, call us. Call us. Text. I know. Text. <laughs> Insta tweet me. Whatever. <laughs> love you i'll do the dishes no i like the first time i a uh, number of thanksgivings ago I, I wanted to learn how to to do a turkey and she did a thanksgiving special so i learned how to cook a turkey i mean really cook a turkey for my own guard wow i'm impressed i know, I know. I'm impressed. um I, and also you actually who know I, I forgot to put him on the list here is alton brown you see mm -hmm. him a lot on the cooking channel mm -hmm. he does a really great historical show so like he'll do his show and he'll have certain things but then he'll take you through some of the history of that which is super interesting so yeah. Alton Brown, mm -hmm. um, the great British baking show. Mm. Mm. It's just great. Yeah. It's great for so many reasons. And I don't, one, I'm not a big, um, I'm not big into, uh, um, TV, like, you know, competition show, mm -hmm. competition bake or cooking shows at all. It's not my thing. Um, but I, oh man, that, sh what did you say? The English are just better than They're us. Just better than us. The English are better. And that show is more proof that the English are just better than it's us. It's just, um, and, uh, beautiful amazing <sighs> and they're like and they're all amateurs mm -hmm. everybody there is an amateur i'm like oh my. nobody's making like brownies or you know um no. cookie dough serving it in a, like it's ice cream no <laughs> and there's reasons to love the great british baking show a because they make some really delicious products really cool stuff but it just kind of restores your faith in humanity a little bit yeah i mean they're competing for a cake stand yeah they're competing for a cake stand and some flowers mm -hmm. and they're so they help each other. Mm -hmm. There's nobody sabotaging. There's nobody mm -hmm. calling anybody bad names. They're not interviewing somebody in between <coughs> takes and they're like, oh, I think they have the worst stuff. Nothing like that at all. No, they're just... like, oh, I didn't do very well today. I'm going to have to call my mom and tell her that I wasn't, I got caught. <laughs> and they were just, oh God. And then of course it all takes place in this beautiful English countryside. I know. <sighs> you I just want to eat the whole thing. Totally. Anyway, mm -hmm. and you, whenever you're feeling stressed out or sad, watch the Great British Baking Show. Trust me. Yeah. And then, um, even if you don't like to bake, cause my friend Dawn, I told her about, it, she's like, well, I don't really like to bake. I'm like, doesn't I matter. don't either. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But they got, she got it. She and her daughter got hooked. Totally. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was going to go back to top chef. If you're going to watch, cause you can stream top chef and there's like 16 seasons of top chef. Let me just tell you right now, the two most worthwhile seasons are season four, um, where we have, uh, Stephanie, uh, Isard ends up winning that season. Sorry. Spoiler alert. Uh, she, she has, uh, a number of really great restaurants in Chicago. If you happen to be in Chicago, uh, go to the Girl and the Goat. That's Stephanie uh, Izard's restaurant. And then there's the um, the Little Goat, which is her little diner across the street from there. Both worthwhile. Mm -hmm. uh, and then season five gives us Carla Hall, who is the greatest Top Chef contestant ever. She never won. She came close. Um, she's amazing. She's she's amazing, and she really has turned Top Chef losing in, on Top Chef into just being sort of iconic now in mm -hmm. terms of um an african-american woman you know who is just a juggernaut have you ever seen her talk about her grandma's cornbread yes uh, <laughs> and she's just funny the woman she's is just funny. hilariously funny talking about this cornbread her grandma would make and oh gosh yeah so funny she's amazing yeah so if you ever are, want to know who carla hall is just a believer she, she's just a reason to believe in food is being awesome mm -hmm. classically trained french chef and just really hilarious mm -hmm. awesome woman and then the nice thing is that if you want to watch episodes of the french chef which is julia child's original cooking show 
you can watch it. Um, you can find it some, you can find little snippets of it on YouTube. PBS has all of it. So you can actually get, um, if you want to spend a little money on PBS's streaming service, uh, it's not very expensive. It's like two ninety nine a month, I think. And then if you want to, you can watch all of the episodes of the French chef on PBS. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, yeah. So if you're into it, uh, and again, there's just, and, and people have their favorites. There's the pioneer woman, there's beat Bobby Flay. There's, the one chick that does the one stuff and the couple that does their stuff. I mean, there literally is just like so many choices for cooking shows. Um, this would just happen to be a list of favorites for me, but you know, there's a bunch. I don't like that one show with Guy Fieri. I think he's a creep. <laughs> well, he always shows stuff that like is not. I'm like, I don't want to eat that. And I eat lots of crap. I know. Most of the time, I was like, oh my god, that looks terrible. No, I just think he's How's creepy. How's the bathroom? <laughs> And that will tell you something. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, this is a picture of Julia Child. That's how she would finish her show. She would say, bon appetit. <laughs> this is the French chef saying, bon appetit. <laughs> so this picture is the chicken sisters. That's what she's showing you all the different types of chickens that you can cook. Yeah, with. the roaster, the broiler. The fryer. The, you know. <laughs> woman was amazing she was amazing yeah. uh so the, uh, there you go um if you want a fun documentary highly recommend the documentary julia um you can rent it on prime mm -hmm. currently 5.99 for a 48 hour rental mm -hmm. and it, if you just want to feel good at the end of it mm -hmm. just watch this it's it's a feel good documentary right no you feel yeah uh, you, you just you feel better if you feel better when you're done mm -hmm. you know you're just like that was totally worthwhile it's worth your time so, so yeah yeah yeah, thanks, anyway, Julia. yeah, thank you, Julia. Thank you for teaching us to eat. Uh, you can still buy, like I said, her cookbook was Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Mm -hmm. You can still buy that book on mm -hmm. Amazon. You can. Like, if you want a signed first edition, they run about 7,000. But mm -hmm. I looked it up because I was curious. I was mm -hmm. like, what? but you know, you can buy, you know, her, it's still, it's still in circulation. It's still in print, which yeah. is remarkable. You know, the first, um, the first, uh, company, the first pr publisher that, uh, offered to publish the book before it was written. Once she finished it, they she pretty much got a rejection letter that said, women are too stupid and lazy to want to cook like this. <laughs> it was basic. They didn't you. say that. They didn't say those exact words. Mm -hmm. What basically was what they said was, oh, women are too stupid uh -huh. and lazy to ever want to uh -huh. cook like this. This is too hard for women. So anyway, um, yeah, so it's, an, you know, it's, it's a, I'm not, I, I love it when people cook for me and I love good food. I do not like to cook. Duncan says I'm good at it, but I don't like to do it. I love to cook. And Jenny does. So I mean, I, 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 I would just have the book just so I could, just so I could see, you know, so I could, you know, cause I think it's a, it's an amazing piece of work is what it is it's amazing and if you have anybody in your life that cooks or like really loves to cook or really loves cookbooks you know i say go out and find a halfway decent uh, copy and present it to them because it's just you know even if nothing else you know some of the recipes you'd like you'd never want to do like you never want to like uh boil down calves hooves so that you can make gelatin nobody wants to do What's that, that? Uh, aspic that's aspic. it nobody oh. but she can also all, but she also teaches you how to poach an egg yeah you know, and how to cook mushrooms you know and and oh oh, boof, 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 boof. <laughs> oh and fun fact um ina garten does an astonishingly good beef boring down recipe and it's essentially Julia Child's recipe. See, so, see, there you go. And again, she takes you, uh, Ina takes you through that process, and mm -hmm. it's just, you know. Yeah. So um, even if, you know, we, we should, on, you know what we should do, Jenny Brothers? What's that? Uh, on uh, Julia Child's birthday every year, we should get that book, and every year we should make one thing. Please, please tell me we don't have to make an aspect. No, we'll make something. Good. We'll make something yummy every time. Okay, well, good. You'll make it, and I'll I'll buy the ingredients. That's fine. And I'll even do the dishes. Yeah, I just you make it. I enjoy cooking. I think it's fun. It's fun to put on some music. Have a glass of wine and chop some vegetables mm -hmm. and brown some meat and i just i just think everything about it is, mm -hmm. is awesome it's relaxing it's fun you know, so, you know who's a really good cook is my husband duncan mm -hmm. you know actually joe is a good cook too when he when he puts himself to it yeah and know? i'm like and, and duncan will use every single freaking <laughs> pan and i walk into the kitchen and i'm like good job baby and you then i just leave you go and i just i just i just step, i just step back i'm like he's doing a great job and i'm not doing it and then he does all the dishes he's like you know i probably could have condense some because I'm like mm -hmm. see that's what Mrs. Kelly taught us in 4-H cooking class is exactly. that you clean as you go you clean as you go yeah. exactly because looks like you always clean as you go and I'm like yeah because I was in 4-H that's, that's what we did yeah, so Mrs. Kelly taught me especially if you have a small kitchen space you gotta clean as you go you clean as you go. and you don't have to use every you know you'd be amazed at how many times you can reuse a bowl <laughs> It's, it's the whole running water thing. It's awesome. Exactly. So anyway, but um, 
But yeah, so my um, actually I bought him an awesome cookbook last Christmas uh, with an amazing pie crust recipe that just makes you want to. It's with a European butter, you know. They, oh, nice. uh, oh, oh my gosh, it's amazing. So anyway, but that's um. Yeah. So yeah, like I so, said, if you're interested, the documentary is Julia. Um, get it on Prime. Mm -hmm. Enjoy yourself. Go eat mm -hmm. something yummy. And again, I'm not going to judge what you eat. You eat whatever you want. Exactly. If you want to sit down, watch Julia, and eat some Twinkies, do it. You do it. Yes. Passion. Passion. Pursue, pursue, pursue your passion. That's right. Some wine and some cheese. And some cheese and some Twinkies. Whatever. You need to get into more some white wine. You know, it's probably not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't love... I, I, I actually... I don't love white wine. I, I really like I'd red wine. I'd rather drink white wine. I like I like the dryness of it. It's mm. more, I'm not a big if I had if my uh, in laws uh, um uh, they always used to buy Fishtown, mm. which is a white wine uh, uh, that's produced in Michigan here. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's very good. It's a really good. You put it in the freezer and let it chill. So mm. maybe it's not good. <laughs> Again, there is, you know, again, taste in anything is relative. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, if that's your taste. Enjoy it. Oh, so, oh, look, there's a kitty. There's a kitty. This this, uh, this episode has a kitty. This is Say cool. hi to everybody. This Ooh, is cool. Kitty. This is cool. He's, he's so sweet. He's, he's, his fur is all warm. He is. He's in the sun. Oh. All right, you guys. Have a great. We'll be back. What are we talking about next time? I don't know. What should we talk about? Should we know. talk about our uh, 80s? Mm, yes. Okay. Let's so do that. I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there, mm -hmm. and then we're going to have music experts, Jim and Tammy, come on with us. I don't know if they know that yet, so if you guys watch this, just know you're going to be on soon. Yeah. This, this, the question is, and I don't even know if we can do this. I don't know either. This is a hard one. What is the one the one song one that is the most 80s, 80s song of all of the 80s? What? You get one. One. There's only one. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah. When we do this, I'm going to talk about five songs that I felt were the most influential <laughs> to me in the 80s, but there is only one quintessential 80s. I don't I, know. Is there? Is I don't there know. Only I don't even know if you can. I don't even know if that's possible. I have a couple of ideas in my head. Okay. But I mean, it's still, it's still a couple of this. Yeah. So look for us probably next week at this time talking about what is, uh, it depends on if we can get Jim and Tammy on here because yeah. there are, there are uh, 80s culture experts, I believe. Okay. So, all right. Anyway, you guys, uh, enjoy your Sunday. Have a great week. Stay warm. Bon appetit. Bon appetit. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I got to take us off. All right, I got to move right. that. I got to get rid of